let me just uh, minimize this screen. So please interrupt me if you have any questions because I cannot see any image now. Uh, actually, hold hold the questions for the uh, for the breaks. Ah, okay, great. Okay. So hopefully um, you can see that I can write here. All right, so what I wanna to discuss today is some of the work that we have been doing in the organic semiconducting area. And when and, and all of this actually started with the Nobel Prize by um, Alan Heger, where he was doping all these um, polymeric structures with extrinsic dopants in order to increase the carry concentration of these materials and turn them into a metallic system, okay? So beside the um, low flexibility, the, the high flexibility and the low cost that of these materials, we also have the opportunity to tune the electronic properties of these materials, right? So you can either induce band and hop and shard transport. Um, since you rely on pi stacking, then you have an isotropic charge carry transport that can happen here. Um, tunable electronics properties, and then you have these carbon structures all over the place, with, which give you low thermal conductivity. So it means that they do not transport heat um, readily. And then due to all these properties, then we can use these materials for uh, various of um, applications, learn, um, um, ranging from um, photovoltaics to light, um, light emitting diodes to um, flexible electronics that can be put into skin or flexible displays and then thermoelectrics. So what I'm gonna mostly be talking about today is in the area of thermoelectrics, which means conversion of heat into electricity. All right, so just to give you an example of what is driving our process, just wanna show you this um, um, video that was put together by my student and he's really proud about it. So I actually like to show it where he actually used um, this conducting polymer called PDOT and he grows it on a substrate. And what he does is that he make a device and he harvests heat from his fingerprints. So, and then you see that there is an increase in the voltage here. And what happens is that you're generating that voltage due to the conversion of the heat from his fingerprint. And then also what he can do now is invert that voltage um, if he actually apply a, a bias in, in a different direction as he is doing right here. And then that's why you will see that this will um, actually go down, okay? So even though that this is impressive because you can see those changes happening in terms of the voltage here, right? These are actually very minimal voltage that you are generating, not enough to, let's say, um, convert all the heat that we have on the planet, uh, which is about 67% heat. So it's a lot of heat, right? So, but the thing is that this is not a very efficient process. And by not being a very efficient process, give us a lot of different um, research directions that we can explore in order to increase the efficiency of these materials. And the way that we do that is by actually um, looking at three different avenues. Being the first one is looking into the fabrication of self-dope organic molecules where we can tune their spin and morphological properties. Um, the second one that we are working on is actually promoting band-like transport in highly conducting polymers, uh, specifically this polymer that's called PDOT here. This is just a bunch of thiophenes um, aligned or um, assembled together. And the recent one that we started looking at is actually these um, pi D conjugated polymers or metal organic frameworks as they are known in the field. And what is exciting about these materials is that they actually show um, quantum topological order so they can be used as uh, topological insulators. Okay, so let me start by discussing the first one here, which is the spin and morphology properties of self-dope organic molecules. So if we actually think about organic molecules, um, what, what happens with them is that they are not that um, efficient, right? So they, they tend to, to suck, that's point out. And the thing is that what we do is that we dump a lot of different dopants into these materials in order to increase their carry concentration and by hence increase their electrical conductivity. 
okay? The problem is that when you start uh, forcing these dopants into these organic molecules, what you end up doing is that you have a lot of phase segregation, right? So if you add more dopant, then you will see that they will just start separating or phase separating and give you two different um, phases or crystal structures. So the, the idea is that um, what would be the right ratio of dopants and organic molecule that will just avoid these from phase separating or phase segregating, okay? And if we actually think at, at the bigger picture, in terms of what is needed to make a device, then you will say, well, I need a P-type material here, right? Where again, you have um, P-dot as your polymer here, then you dope it. And then you will see that it has a, a high electrical conductivity that if you multiply your conductivity and your CBA coefficient, then you will get this power factor here that is um, pretty decent, okay? So then you can do the same thing with P-dot, um, tosylate. So you're doping it with a tosylate um, anion in here. And then you can also have an N-type counterpart of these molecules, right? So you can have these um, polymers that again, you are doping them with uh, a small molecule doping that is called DMBI. And well, you will increase their conductivity, but these conductivities are not as impressive as what you will have with PETA. So the n-type part of making an n-type um, organic thermoelectric material is lagging when we compare it to the um, p-type counterparts. And that raised the question of, um, can we actually develop uh, understanding of the structure of thermoelectric property relationship of these materials? Can we control the dopant? Can we avoid these uh, molecules from phase segregating um, from the dopant? And the way that we think about that is that, can we just have one material that can do all these different functions, right? So we have this tetrahedron here, where I have, let's say, can I have an organic semiconductor that I can um, combine with this conducting filler in order to have a material with a high carry concentration. And then can I further boost this concentration by adding that counter ion or that dopant in there? And, and then I have this um, insulating polymer that can just con control my mechanical properties, right? But the, the thing here now, is that this is actually a product that I will want in just one material, right? Okay, so we believe that if this, is, this is important due to the fact that if we compare what is out there in terms of organic thermoelectrics and we look at the CBEC coefficient, right? And the electrical conductivity here, there's this um, empirical line where we believe that all of these materials follow, right? And just to give you a perspective, um, everything that is plotted here, most of it belong to the same family, right? So why is there so much, so much variability that is happening? And we believe that the variability is actually determining the amount of density of states that you're um, having in your material near to the firm edge and is deviating some of these materials from this line. And we believe that this is related to some changes in morphology, okay? All right, so what we decided to do was actually uh, synthesize these self-dope organic molecules. And our um, example that we're using here as the parent is actually this PDI, so it's this perylene diamide molecule. And then we tether the dopant to the molecule, right? So we tether it at this amide position right there. And what this is causing is that since the dopant is tethered to the molecule now, it cannot phase segregate because it can't go anywhere. Right? So what you will end up having here is that now you will have a donor receptor, um, depending on if you have an N-type or a P-type. So you will have a donor receptor that is comprising a single set of molecular orbitals. 
and your density of states will be homogeneous, okay? So this is the, again, the PDI that we're using. And these are the dopants that we have here. And what we're doing is that we are comparing what will happen in terms of increasing the steric hindrance of the molecule, right? So this is just um, increasing in, in hindrance. And then we have the on dope PDI that we just use as a control. So we did some quick calculations because I'm not an organic chemist, so I don't want my students going to the lab and trying to make these molecules and we actually can. So we run some um, calculations just to show if these um, dopants are actually um, changing the um, molecular orbitals of these materials, right? So we actually run the calculation for the on dope PDI. What we will see is that the HOMO and LUMO are truly um, um, distributed through the core of the PDI. And then when we actually put in the self dopen in here, then we will see that this is actually centralized where the self dope um, PDI now, um, the HOMO is localized on the dopen and then the LUMO is localized on the core, right? So this means that now we can actually use this electron density to um, inject carriers into the core of the PDI, okay? So this is possible theoretically. And what we wanted to know is that, is, can we control morphology by making films? So we try a bunch of different techniques and going from drop casting, spray coating and, and vapor transport, where the drop casting would just give us these very ununiform um, needles. And then um, the same thing as the ultrasonic spray. And then, so we rely on the vapor transport that was actually giving us like these very smooth um, films, okay? So then if we actually compare um, the AFM images of these materials, then we get grain sizes that range from about, let's say 15 nanometers all the way to like 25 nanometers, okay? But the, the important takeaway here is that by using vapor transport, we can actually make uniform films where we know that all these materials have the same uh, morphology property. So we don't have to worry about what is the morphology um, um, contribution into the electrical properties or the electronic properties that we're seeing. Okay, so we did some um, Grayson incident wide angle X-ray scattering experiment at, um, at Stanford Synchrotron Research Lab in which it allowed us to um, figure out how these um, materials were actually um, stacking with respect to the substrate, okay? And this is important because now if we know that these things are stacking face on, then we'll most likely want to use it for a photovoltaic device. If this is stacking edge on, then it means that we want to use it as a field effect transistor, okay? So we end up getting all this data right here. And what it shows is that whenever we do the vapor transport for um, as the self dope for the self dope um, molecules, they are very oriented here, as we can see by just the, um, the contribution of all these different dots. Okay. So qualitatively, this is fine. But my student actually wanted to generate a method that he called the mosaicity factor in which he can actually quantitatively say how much is oriented with respect to the substrate and in what direction, right? So here is what this means. So if you have um, an MF that is equal to one, then it means that your material is oriented face on with respect to the substrate then zero means no orientation, and then echon means uh, orientation of minus one. Okay, so if we actually look at this data again, then we will see that most of these, like, well, we can say that 93%, um, and 90, 90, well, between 90, 89% and 93% of the sample is actually oriented face on, 
which means that then we can make our photovoltaic devices out of these materials. Okay, so we look at the photoluminescence properties where um, at room temperature, what is happening? So this is the, um, so when, let's talk about the room temperature first. So the room temperature, now you have the Ondo PDI that gives you a very strong PL signal, right? And whereas when you have the, um, the dope samples, you don't have any signal in there, okay? And this is actually a good indication that we are actually forming radicals in these materials. And then we did a quick solid state experiment, right? Where um, we can actually corroborate uh, 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 that there is no changes in the morphology as we heat up or cool down these materials. Okay, so then since we're forming these radicals, then we can quantify spin concentrations by EPR, right? And we did a little bit of synthetic changes here because now what we're doing is that we are, we are adding a counter ion, so the hydroxide and the iodide here versus the free amine in this one. And we can see what is happening in terms of trends. So what we see here, is that if we have the free amine, so these black um, dots, then the spin concentration will decrease with steric hindrance, okay? Whereas if we have the counter ions here, the hydroxide or the iodide, then we are seeing that this is actually increasing, okay? So there is definitely opposite trends, and then the hydroxide gave us the highest spin concentration from all the samples. So there are likely different um, trends that are happening that is related to different dopant mechanisms, right? And if we actually thermally anneal these materials, right, in different environments, what we see is that um, the one that is less hindered, so the smallest one, actually de-dopes when we heat it, right? And then for number one and number three, which is increasing the steric hindrance, we see an increase in the concentration when we thermally anneal it, okay? Which can be related to a change in um, uh, uh, ordering, right? Or the fact that at higher temperatures, we have more carrier injection from the dopant into the um, PDI core. Okay, so, so we try to understand what was happening by doing some NEXAF experiments here. And we did this uh, at Beamline 10 one at Stanford. And what we did here is that we look at different angles. Since it's a polarized beam, then you can just find a relationship between the polarized beam and the electric field, right? In order to see if there is any changes in the orientation of these molecules. Okay, so the thing is that we have two different regions here that we know that are related to the PDI core. All right, and then another region that is related to the tails, okay? So we try to get what the dichroic ratio will be for these materials, which was a little bit challenging because now you have the contribution from the um, floppy tail that is also moving there. So we couldn't get a good relationship there. But what was really interesting here is that if you actually um, look at on dope PDIs and you do um, NEXAF modeling as was shown by the group of Shenan Bao, um, you will see that there are three um, contributions here in the NEXAF that comes from the, um, the core, the interaction of the core within the PDI, okay? So we actually blow up our data, right? What we will see here is that we have actually four distinct peaks for the amide carbon, okay? Whereas the on dope again is showing three different peaks. So we believe that there is a unique molecular orbital configuration that is attributed to the fact that we are doping these materials and that we have an extra um, electron that is sitting in the LUMO um, that is residing along the amide position. So the way that these things are doping is that if I have my core here, right, what will happen is that the core is very much oriented so that the tails are, um, 
cells are just injecting charges rightly into the core, okay? All right, so what we can say here then is that by looking at self double small molecules and we generate these highly oriented films where we can control the amount of charge carriers in these uh, molecules without affecting morphology due to the fact that we do not have these extrinsic um, um, dopants into the structure. So I'm just gonna stop there and see if you guys have any questions. Yeah, uh, we'll start with a question from Matthew Marcus. Hi, just a, a two a suggestions about the possible techniques to use. You know, one of them is scanning transmission X-ray microscopy, which gives you a direct real space information with chemical sensitivity. And uh, yeah, the other is a resonance uh, 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 you know, soft X-ray scattering. And it's sort of like SACS, except that where you do it at the carbon edge, mm -hmm. or you could in principle do it at the nitrogen edge, and you get in orientational information as well as, uh, as well as spatial and chemical. So it's a pretty versatile technique. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for those comments. Um, so we were actually scheduled, I, I think you are referring to doing like RSOX. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we were scheduled to do that um, when it was fall of 2020. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> so you will understand what is happening. <laughs> yeah. I work at ALS, so I, I know exactly. Was that our socks at ALS? No, so it was actually going to be at Brookhaven. Uh -huh. Yeah, ALS has a, has a similar rig, and I run the uh, sticks in there. Oh, nice. Okay, so I will definitely follow up with you um, on that. Yeah, you have to grow, uh, grow your films on silicon nitride windows. Right, yeah, but, which is easy because we can do it on, va on using vapor transport. So that will definitely be uh, something that we can do. And, um, and actually I will follow up because the um, ALS beam time is on March, the deadline is March 5th. Uh, March so, 3, actually, for, oh, it's for, March, for, for oh, Yeah, I thought I had an extra two days. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Better get on the stick. <laughs> but yeah, so I will look into that, definitely. Okay. Very good. We also have a question from Yang Ha. Okay, Hi. so... Oh. Hi, I, I just want to to ask details about the uh, your experimental conditions when you measure the x-ray absorption because uh, we usually encounter a lot of photo damage with organic molecules and sometimes yep. the beam itself may induce some some radicals or some some yeah so so that that might be related with your your polymer reactivity yeah that's true because you can have um, photo induced charge transfer where you actually, yeah, induce a formation of these radicals um, um, per se. So yeah, so we actually took um, care of that. So we actually look at different um, ex beam, beam time exposure as well and, and attenuation. I, I don't remember the details right now. And, and we compare them to see if there was any beam damage that was asso associated to these samples, right? So for these particular samples, we actually didn't see any photo damage. Um, but there's actually another project that I'm working on that is related to perovskites. And yeah, there we see a lot of beam time, beam time, um, beam photo damage, but not for these ones in particular. Okay, uh, you should continue, Louisa, thank you. You're welcome. All right, so let me go to the next topic. And what we're looking at here is actually looking at um, promoting band-like transport in um, highly conducting polymers. So, so again, we now we're focusing on PETA here. And we are looking into PETA given that it works as a really good um, thermoelectric material where you want to increase the figure of merit here by increasing 
the electrical conductivity and the sieve coefficient and decreasing the thermal conductivity, okay? So since P dot has regions that are disorder, so regions that are disorder right here, and then regions that are highly conducting, then you basically have like a love and hate relationship here where you will have um, the insulating nature. So the disorder of nature that is helping you decrease the thermal conductivity and then the highly uh, order conjugated um, structure here that is helping with the um, increasing the electrical conductivity, okay? Um, so we, we can actually polymerize um, P dot here. And the, the problem is that when you polymerize P dot and you put it in, a, uh, in water or some polar solvent, then it will just crush out of solution, right? So, and it's actually not as conducted anymore. So what you can do is actually put in these counter ions that can serve as dopants and actually helps with um, the miscibility of PDOT in aqueous solutions. Okay, so now whenever you start adding these dopants in here, what happens is that you induce a uh, uh, distortion of the, um, the chains that is accompanied by a positive charge that in this case, we will call it a polaron or a radical cation, depending if you're a physicist or a chemist, right? And then this has a half integer spin. So it means that is EPR active, right? So, and then if you start dopening even more, then you can actually induce the formation of these bipolarons or dicarions in, in, in PDOT, okay? So the, the good thing here is that there are morphological distortions that are happening where a neutral P dot molecule will have more of a benzoidal character. And then when you start doping it, it will just transition more to a quinoidal character, okay? All right, so again, we look into what kind of fabrication we can have here. So again, you have, we look at, we explore two different polymerization protocols one that we call um, chemical polymerization here, where we just spin coating both um, precursors. So iron X being X, the dopant that we're using. So let's say iron chloride or iron tosylate, and then the monomer in E dot, and then you anneal it, and then this will end up forming P dot. Then we also look into vacuum, vi vacuum vapor phase polymerization where you have iron, um, your precursor, so iron chloride or iron tosylate, and then you have a vapor of your E dot uh, monomer, and then eventually that will form <clears throat> that um, film that is P dot, okay? So again, we look at what this thing look in terms of GI wax, right? And um, these are very um, oriented films that again, we can quantify the degree of orientation and create a cartoon that tell us that if we have a vapor, vacuum vapor polymerization, phase polymerization protocol, it will give us the highest um, oriented films, okay? Then we can look at Raman in order to compare the structural changes that are happening in the molecule. Right, so we see all the different contributions here that come from different stretching modes in the um, structure. And then we can just look at what is happening in terms of the kinoidal and benzoidal character of the molecule. And what we observe is that when we start doping it more with either tosylate or chloride, then this will just um, transition to uh, lower um, wave numbers, which is indicative of this being more of a kinoidal um, character, okay? And since it has more of a kinoidal character, it's a qualitative way of saying that we have some polaronic states present in, in the structures or in the tin films. Okay, so, so this is gonna be a really busy, um, explanation because even though that we did next up here 
uh, for all these different samples, and we just have all the data there, it tells us actually quite a bit from our material. Okay, so, so again, with NEXAF, and, and I have some of my students in here since I, I was supposed to be teaching now, so probably it helps if I tell them this. So, but with NEXAF, what we're doing is that we are actually um, probing empty orbitals, okay? So it's very important that we, we, we actually mention that. Okay, because what will happen is that if you're um, decreasing the, um, the intensity, then it means that we're filling up more of those empty orbitals that um, are associated to the resonance of the transition state. Okay, all right, so we have our four different samples in here. And the first thing that we can talk about is that um, regardless of the sample, we see a split in here of the pi star. Oops, gosh, where did I go? This really put me into, uh, yeah. So we see a splitting of the pi star, right? And this, the splitting of the pi star is actually related to the delocalization of the electronic structure um, along the conjugated backbone of this P dot structure, okay? So that is the first um, takeaway that we can get here from this data. Then the next thing that we are seeing is that the onset of where the pi star is happening happens at a lower photon energy for um, the chemical polymerized samples. Uh, which is um, what we call CPP.CL and then CPP.tacylate. And since this, um, this signal is happening at a, at a higher, um, I'm sorry, at a lower um, photon energy, then that will be in negative that we have more non-discrete electronic states that are related to uh, more um, conjugation. And that conjugation, again, tells us that we have more of a benzoidal character in these molecules, okay? So again, since we are probing empty orbitals, then we have a decrease in the intensity of the pi star that is suggesting that we have a rehybridization of um, the carbon double bond um, in the system that is, due, that is gonna result in the formation of a small um, polaron formation. Okay, so if we actually compute all of that, then we can say that the whenever we prepare the samples using the vacuum vapor polymerization process, this is yielding samples with a higher concentration of polaronic states, and that Cl minus and tosylate minus as dopants are actually um, donating electron density to the pitot core, okay? All right, so then we, we try to con correlate that to um, changes that we are seeing in the conductivity and the CVET coefficient here in terms of the EPR signal. So again, with the vapor vacuum uh, VVPP um, process, um, we see that this is the sample that has the highest electrical conductivity, right? And, but not necessarily the highest um, CBA coefficient, which is actually telling us that we have more of a band-like transport in um, pedotosylate um, produced by the vacuum vapor polymerization phase um, fabrication, right? Then um, if you actually go to p dot and the VVP, then we have some bipolar hopping that is taking place here. And then from the p dot cp then we have just polar formation that we can transition into bipolar if we actually change the fabrication protocol. And we can compare that if we actually do a simple EPR experiment where for p dot cl we see a signal here so again this is telling us that we are mostly polar one dominated and then for the other three samples we actually have no signal right and the fact that we have no signal can mean two things 
So the worst case scenario is that our EPR system is not working, which I don't think is that. Or two, that we actually have um, polar ones coming together to form these bipolar ones, which will increase the con conductivity of our uh, materials. Okay. So then with that, then we'll have that we can transition from polar to bipolar hopping, uh, which will increase the CBIC, and then hop into band transport, which will decrease the CBIC, given the inverse relationship of CBIC with um, carrier concentrations. Okay. So that's why it goes down. All right, so then we can look at the thermoelectric properties of these materials. So if we actually look at the electrical conductivity and the CBIC, we can actually um, compute what the power factor will be. And the power factor is just a relationship between CBIC and the electrical conductivity, okay? So then what we see here is that for the um, pitot tosylate sample, we have the highest power factor, okay? But what does that actually mean if you're not in the field? Probably doesn't mean that much if we don't talk about what is happening in terms of transfer mechanism. So what we ended up doing here is that we fitted um, our power factor to this transport edge um, mechanism, mechanism that is related to this transport, param transport parameter. And this pr transport parameter will say, well, if you have a transport parameter of S equal three, then, and you fit your data, then it will fit and, and it will say that you mostly have an undoped or highly disordered sample where the transport parameter numbers would be less than 0 0.003, that when you um, convert that to figure of merit, then this will be less than 0 0.01 at 300K. Then if you actually fit your um, data to a transport parameter of S equal one and it fits, then it's basically saying that you have a crystalline sample that is highly conducting, and we got a transport parameter for p dot tosylate of 235 Siemens per centimeter, that if we convert that to figure of merit, that is 0.3 to 0.6 at 300K. And I'm putting this range here because it's dependent on the K since we don't have the thermal conductivity. So I'm assuming that we have a thermal conductivity that goes from 0.2, uh, the other way around. So 0.4 will give you a thermal uh, a figure of merit of 0.3. And then uh, thermal conductivity of 0.2 will give you a figure of merit of 0.6 at 300K. So we actually get this type of thermal conductivity. This will actually put us at a figure of merit that is higher than what has been reported for PDOT on its own. So the highest um, is 0.42 at 300K, but this is assuming that you have a kappa of 0.2 or a thermal conductivity of 0.2. Okay. All right. So then with that, then we can say that if we actually want to make highly conducting polymers, then the vacuum vapor phase polymerization allows for uh, the formation of these highly conducting and very um, oriented molecules where you can use um, tosylate as the dopant to induce very high uh, figure of merit um, structures. Okay, so I'm gonna stop here again and open the floor for questions. Um, uh, one question uh, for context. Um, uh, the inorganic uh, thermoelectrics, uh, whether it's the uh, antimony containing alloys or other more exotic things, what are their figures of merit typically? I'm just trying to get a sense of scale. Yeah, so uh, so actually, so let me see, I'm in slide 28. So I, if I actually go to slide one, right? Thank you, you may so, have had it there, sorry. No, no, I don't have it there, but, uh, okay. but I think it helps explain in the context. Uh -huh. Which I think is, is important, as well I mentioned it. But the thing is that this is actually a commercially available thermoelectric piece, right? 
And the component of this uh, device is actually bismuth telluride. Okay. okay, not antimony, okay, yes. Or, or some of them have like a mix of antimony too. So, so you have bismuth telluride here that has a ZT of about 1.1 1 .1 at room temperature, okay? But nowadays you actually have uh, more exotic structures because what happened is that when you, um, let's say you have a mix of bismuth telluride and antimony telluride, what you're doing is just um, trumping the formation of um, uh, vibronic states, right? which, or yeah, which we can call them just phonons. So you just have like, um, you have less phonons that you are um, generating these materials, which will actually help you decrease the thermal conductivity. So if you actually have a cocktail of antimony telluride and bismuth telluride um, that people have grown by epitaxial um, fabrication, then this I think is 2.2, at around like 350 to 400 K, okay? So, but it, it, the, the price goes up quite a bit, all right? So, so it's mostly pricing now. <laughs> so in general, the, uh, the point here is that you're gonna get um, relatively close, but not all the way, uh, of course, to the performance of the alloys. You uh, won't. But you're going to be able to do it very inexpensively, large surface areas, novel right. applications, and so yes. on. Yes, that's Got exactly it. it. Okay, Thank you. very good. Um, uh, to make sure we finish close to on time, I'm going to suggest that you continue and we'll come back to other questions. Yeah. At the end. Okay, great. Okay, so, so now the third topic is actually a topic that we started working quite recently. And we have been looking into um, these pi D conjugation polymers, mostly inspired by graphene, right? Where you can actually use graphene as a flexible, as an electrode for flexible electronics or for solar cells, not much as the active layer. And you can potentially use it to, uh, for water desalination um, processes. And beside all the, you know, the fancy quantum properties that it has. Okay, so the, the thing that we know about graphene is that it does not have a band gap, right? And what you can do is that you can just treat graphene in order to generate a band gap in this material, either by heteroatom doping or oxidation or reduction of all of these different things that actually prompted the, um, it, given the uh, Nobel Prize, um, when it was, I forgot when it was, a Nobel Prize to, uh, to Gaim and Nosolova, Novoselov, um, forgot when it was, I think it was like 2007 or something like that. Anyways, so the thing is that, um, can we actually look at other 2D structures that can be um, structurally tunable, right? And and we uh, started collaborating with a theoretician where he's like, well, why don't you guys, we have these um, structures and, um, and we have done a lot of calculations on them and they seems to actually rival or be better than graphene. We can um, prove some of the experimental properties. So we started working on these um, pi D conjugated molecules where um, the richness of these molecules is that you can now have different linkers that you can combine with different metal centers that will allow you to have very highly tunable structures and a lot of them, right? So, and again, theoretically, you can do a lot of things. Sometimes experimentally, it's not that easy. So um, we're like, well, can you just give us a slice of the molecules that we should be looking at? So we started um, fabricating some of these materials where we have a nickel center here and then this hexaminobenzene, so we call it nickel HAB, and then this nickel bistyolene that um, theoretically they should show that they have um, topological insulating activities, right? So then you, 
you have then if you, if you change these systems, then you can have this copper um, bicyanoanthracene or this manganese anilato that actually show magnetic properties. Okay, and then you have copper BHT, which um, show that it should be a superconductor. Okay, so we actually look at what has been done in the in the literature or in the field in terms of fabrication of these materials, well, it dates back all the way to about 2015, where um, depending on how you make it, then you get all these very non-uniform structures, okay? And then recently, uh, the group of Denka MIT, um, he came up with a hydrothermal uh, fabrication um, protocol that still doesn't give you very large area films, but what is really neat about this is that it gives you true single crystal materials, right? Which you can, by lithography, put it into a device and then see how these exotic um, properties show up. Okay, so we, 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 we started to explore some of these fabrication processes and one that we look at for um, a very short period was this liquid interface assisted deposition, where now what you have is two different solvents or two different liquids, um, that one is a polar and one is a nonpolar. And then what happens is that you can have at the interface of those two liquids, the formation of this um, to the coordination polymer, okay? And that is what is being shown here. And then you can then lift it up and then see if they are good enough or not. The thing is that when we did this method, my student was very um, discouraged by the fact that they were very full of defects, right? So we actually went back to our chemical vapor deposition process where we developed two methods, one that we call the solid solid, and then the solid, oh, not the solid, solid, sorry, solid vapor, and then the vapor, vapor. And the difference here is just the way that this is deposited. So we actually have a solid, it means that the substrate has the metal precursor. So in this case, it will be some copper um, two plus precursor, okay? And then the vapor, will have the linker, okay? Okay, and then in the vapor-vapor process, then you will have the metal here and then the linker as well, okay? So then we are doing this in a dual heating zone because now the uh, melting point of these two materials is different. So we are relying on the fact that we can heat them at two different um, temperatures. And then eventually, then we will see that the film is formed here. So we actually follow that process. Then we can actually make very large areas of these films that if we look under, you know, closely in a picture, then you will see that it's pretty layered, right? And then, um, we have, again, this AFM images that show that, th that they're pretty layer. So what we're trying to do now is actually be able to just grow a single monolayer of these materials. But for now, they are multiple layers. So we're talking about um, 20 to 30 um, layers in a film. Okay, so if we actually take one of those and we do TEM um, experiments, then again, these are, um, the pieces are in single crystalline at least. But what is really interesting is that if we follow in um, the vapor-vapor um, polymerization where both components, so both precursors are in the vapor phase, then this is actually oriented in an AA stacking. Then now if we do a solid vapor, then this is, is uh, oriented um, in a A, B stacking, so it's actually um, flipped or slipped, sorry, slipped, right? So then if, if we compare the, the way that these films are oriented by doing GIXT again, 
then what we see is that we have a better orientation for the solid vapor than what we have for the vapor vapor, even though that both of them are highly oriented. Okay, so then we, um, there's some next half here. And the nice thing is that here we actually could look at the temperature dependence of that next half. So if you actually have the vapor vapor, um, again, we are seeing all the different um, contributions that come from the electronic structure, but there is not much orientation um, at the surface, okay? So we can actually compare that by looking at the dichroic ratio, given that if we have the solid vapor fabrication process, then we have a very anisotropic sample at the, um, that is at least at the surface, since we're probing just the surface, right? And, and another interesting thing that happens here is that we have a splitting of that pi star, right? That can be related to different, um, electronic states um, present in the material, and then we can just find what the dichroic ratio is for those states. So if you have a dichroic ratio minus one, then that means that it's perfectly aligned parallel to the substrate. So in this one, we don't have any orientations as isotropic. Then for this one it has minus 0 0.60, which means that some of the um, layers are actually oriented with respect to the substrate. Okay, so if we look at the electrical conductivity now um, versus temperature, what is really interesting here is that if we use a solid vapor um, sample, then we will see that the temperature, the, the electrical conductivity decreases with temperature. So this is basically telling me that we have a lot of metallic states in this material. With the vapor, uh, with the vapor vapor, then we see that the electrical conductivity increases with temperature, which will um, suggest that we have more semiconducting states, right? Which by looking at the next half data, then we can say that, well, this is actually has more defect states compared to the um, solid vapor sample. Okay, so that is a really nice correlation that we can have with the next half with the electrical conductivity and the fact that we can induce our uh, metallic behavior, which is necessary in order to see these topological states. So ARPES is coming soon, and that is actually we're doing it at ALS. Um, so then in summary, what we can say is that we can fabricate these large area films Right, and we can induce the, the formation of these semiconducting to metallic transition states that can be controlled by um, tuning the defect states in these materials. And it's a really good platform where we can um, hope to realize topological insulating states in these materials. So with that, I, I hope I convince you that we have been looking at different ways of increasing the, the performance of organic molecules in different areas of um, energy and conversion and storage. And with that, I have to thank my group. They're the one that do all the work. Um, all the different people that have given us bean time. So we have done all our GI work. So our, our GI wax work at CHESS, so at Cornell. And then our next half work has been at Brookhaven um, and at Slack. And of course, the funding. And thank you guys for listening. And I'm open for more questions. Very nice. Um, uh, I'll start with kind of a general question. The, uh, uh, of course, making topological insulators, whether they're magnetic or not, with these organics is really fascinating. Um, uh, uh, what would be the practical application along the lines? Uh, is it a thermoelectric application or just fundamental interest? What's the, the motivation in the community for making these topological insulators with organic monolayers? Yeah, so, so actually we are trying, so I'm gonna tell you my motivation and then the field motivation. Okay. So, so with my motivation, since we're doing a lot of these thermoelectric work, right? And if you actually have topological insulating states, then you have spin states that you can control. 
So now the idea will be, well, if, if they show that they have thermoelectrical properties, which they show, can we put them into in a magnetic field and then see if we can polarize the spins, okay? So if you can combine the thermoelectric with the spins, then you can form something that's called a spin calorotronic system. And, and actually, it, it takes me to the application of I'm sitting here and I have my computer on my lap and it's getting pretty hot. Right. So, so the thing is that if you can convert that heat and turn it into a spin response, right? And then with spin response, you just have technically two spin responses, right? Mm -hmm. So, so then you can just use that to um, store um, um, information in a computer, for example. Okay. So, so that, so that is my motivation. The other, the other part now is that if you start seeing all these topological insulated states in these materials, then you can have like very exotic, like spin, um, anomalous Hall effect um, going on that can actually help with the fabrication of um, quantum computing technologies for in, um, like data storage and whatnot. Okay, and, and if you actually see um, insulating states, most likely you will be able to see superconducting states in there, right? So, so yeah, so you, so you will see those superconducting states. Now the, the challenge will be, can you <laughs> increase the TC to see it at a higher temperature, right? And uh, thus, uh, uh, thus, solid state physics continues. Um, got it. <laughs> um, okay, very good. Uh, Yang Ha, you had a question? Yeah, I just wonder, have you ever considered any like sulfur edge or copper edge experiment on the last system? The reason I'm asking is I've been working with the transition metal dioxiding systems, which are just the like a monomer of your system. So the sulfur copper bonding can be very covalent and and very and being like oriented so i wonder have you considered those like a uh, small systems comparing with your, your polymers which might be yeah so so we have not done xf on the copper edge um on these materials but i recently submitted a being uh, a beam beam line proposal for um to do um, XF on the copper edge. Uh, we have not done anything on the sulfur edge since it sits on this spot of uh, not soft, but not not being soft enough, but not too hard enough, if that makes sense. So, so it's really hard to get beam time to do sulfur edge, um, but we are working on that. So we have done XPS uh, on the sulfur edge, and actually we use the copper intensity and the sulfur intensity to quantify the number of defects that we have in that material, which I, I, I didn't talk about that, but in, in our paper, we actually discussed that quite extensively. You have a crystal structure of the polymer, it's like... So we, we have a crystal structure of the copper BHD. That, um, yeah, so based on the uh, TEM data that we had, we were able to isolate some single crystal flakes that the single crystal guy sold the crystal structure for us. Okay. What? Any follow up, Yang Ha? Uh, yeah, can, can you direct me to, to a paper so I can? So yeah, so shoot. Um, it's okay, we can we can do that offline. That's all right. No, oh, okay, it's, you have it in the there. talk. Oh, good. Okay. So it's in the talk. So it's this one. Oh shoot. Oh uh, god. Yeah. Advanced functional material. Okay. Yeah. All right. I'll just go to your publication list and look for that. No, no problem. <laughs>